first of all, welcome. I appreciate you taking your time out tonight to uh, to spend it with us at the kickoff of the uh, annual leadership conference, uh, the AI annual leadership conference, ALC as we call it. So we'll start tonight with uh, with a growth session, um, and we have uh, two more this evening, three tomorrow, and three the next night. So you've all seen, all seen the schedule. You have the, you have the Zoom links, obviously, since you're on here uh, with me uh, in the group tonight. So I appreciate that. So my name is Jim Clare, um, the VP of membership, and also the coach in chief. So I'll be on the coaching uh, coaching webinar tomorrow. Um, and so one of my roles is really to help kind of work and look at some some growth the growth of hockey in Illinois at, at all levels, but specifically really at the youngest levels um, and, and what we can do as a community to, uh, to help, um, you know, spur that on, especially after we just, we've just been through, right? I think everybody has seen it at the ranks and, and seen the numbers. I know as we go through the numbers here at USA Hockey and both at AHI, um, the, the, the numbers are down obviously from last season. So our goal here between now and, and you know, actually all the way through next season is what can we do as a collective to, um, to brainstorm and come up with some good ideas and thoughts to share with each other to help us move forward with, uh, with growing the game. So uh, Rachel will put up the, the first slide. So I'm gonna just kind of re recap. We've met over the last couple of, couple of months with a, a group of hockey directors, rink managers, learn to skate, learn to play program folks, um, and uh, uh, you know, club administrative type, type folks to try to figure out and, and talk about some of the things that have gone on here in Illinois and what we've seen across the country. So go to the next slide. So we're gonna focus here, first off, as I said, on the kind of the challenges, kind of the barriers to entry real quick. I'll do a, a recap of those first two of, of the previous meetings we've had. What can USA AI and the Blackhawks as well let's do to assist? We have a couple of guest speakers with us today, Katie Holmgren, Director of USA Hockey Program Services. So Katie will talk to you a little bit about what USA Hockey has to offer us as well. And I have Erica uh, Lehman from, from U.S. Figure Skating coming on. I've seen a couple of presentations with Erica, or a few of us have, um, of some really good social media um, advertising type um, solutions to help drive uh, kids and folks to your ranks and to the ranks and to your programming and, and how she has seen it, it being used and how we can maybe bring that into, uh, in a, into AI a little bit more. Um, we'll cover a couple of things of what has worked and what's available today within the AI programming. And then I'll just touch real quickly on USA Hockey goaltending, because obviously that's part of growing the game as well. I just want to put that out there so you see it, but we'll, we'll spend most of our time in the middle there. <clears throat> so let me just recap real quick so I can get to our guest speakers. Um, some of the things that were identified in the groups we've had, we've had groups about 25, 30, sometimes 40 folks on the, on the growth calls to, to really just list out what's what challenges the clubs are seeing, the rinks are seeing uh, at all age levels. This isn't, this isn't just at 8U, it's all the way up through high school and beyond, right? Is that there are competing interests and activities, obviously uh, there's other things for the kids to do. Um, some complacency, some of the clubs identified and even some kind of self-identified complacency that we just kind of we just kind of show up and it happens and the kids are there and we have a club and we roll, right? As opposed to, uh, are we really going after, how do we make our programming the best it can be? Um, and not necessarily competing with each other, right? But really helping each other and working with each other to build good programming. So those kids want to come and play and stay there or even start to, to, to get involved in the game at the youngest ages, right? We realize that hockey is not easy to learn. You have to learn how to skate before you can learn how to really play the game as opposed to other sports that you just use your feet. Most kids can walk and run, so they don't really learn, learn that. Our sport's different. The pathways to develop, we've talked a lot about this at AHI. I've talked with the Blackhawks about it in, in, on several occasions too, is, is trying to help identify what's, what's the new parent coming in with their child for the first time. If they don't have brothers or sisters that have played, what's, what does it all mean? Hockey in, in not just Illinois, but across the country can be confusing. Tier one, tier two, <clears throat> house, um, all the different, you know, learn to play, learn to skate, all the different programming that we have. So trying to ease that confusion. Uh, looking at helping the kids start later. Maybe you don't want, don't want to start till about 12 or 14. Do we have programming that allows opportunities for those kids to do that? And um, the lack of fun was something that somebody said was a challenge. And, and I hope that's not true because really this, that's hopefully why most of us are playing the sport is, is the fun, right? Cost is obvious um, as far as uh, the sport safety. You know, we, we, I think we all do a pretty good job of keeping it that way. Finding programming. How do we get, again, we'll talk about that with Erica. How do we get out and about? make sure that people in our communities know where the programming is. 
there's obviously a large time commitment with with uh, with hockey as well. And you know, accessing different communities, diversity, right? What are we doing around that piece of it, each as clubs individually and as a as a larger collective statewide? Um, accessing equipment, but again, back to the cost, right? It's not uh, it's not cheap to play hockey. So how do we help them? Uh, the newest kids get get that equipment and get it in front of them. So some of the things we talked about overcoming those is, is you know, is clubs getting really in tune with your rank and you learn to play programming and getting involved there, um, especially at, you know, at the, at the house level and at the learn to play and learn to skate level, not just focusing on tier two. We have a whole section on the house, house programming coming up in a couple of days. So we'll really dive into that. Um, some clubs have members, you know, required to do volunteer tier hours, right? Use those hours to help to learn to play, right? Have those, have, have the kids volunteer or parents, even coaches volunteer, and it helps them um, take, you know, eliminate some of the cost and take care of their volunteer hours. So do, just don't make it manning a table, but we actually make it on ice as well. Uh, the starter gear, we, we have that starter gear program, the one goal program here in, in Illinois, we'll talk about that. Um, and a lot of clubs have taken that gear, given it to the learn the try hockey for free events that they have. And if those kids register for the next step, or learn to play or learn to skate in the rink, and they get to keep that gear, right? Just one way to eliminate some of the costs, right? And then I said before, getting involved with your park district ranks or any ranks, right? Help them with learn to play signups, learn to skate signups, get involved in the administrative side of it as well. So some of the things that have uh, that have been, you know, utilized to help overcome some of those barriers, and those are the things that we'll work with, in the, when, you know, as we talk more about growth going forward beyond today and into the into the next few months. Okay, by the next slide. Oh, and officials, I don't want to forget about that last one, especially, right? Uh, there's a couple on there, right, around try hockey for free events. We'll talk about those as well. Um, but the officials, we can't have the game without them. And I know uh, when I Iowa speaks tomorrow, they'll talk about the need for officials and how many have been lost um, for a variety of reasons. I won't get into that. I'll let them cover it. But really encouraging that as well, right? That's the hockey is for life, you know, process that we go through. You know, whether they're coaching or they're playing men's league or, or women's teams or they're officiating, uh, keeping them in the game. And we need to get more of those as well. So that will help us uh, with our game. But right, next slide. OK, so that was just a quick recap. Uh, I kind of went through that quick. Uh, this will all be up up on the on the website here in a few days. So you'll be able to, to download some of this and take a look at it more in depth. Uh, but I really want to get to Katie and Erica, uh, kind of the meat of the programming today. So Katie Holmgren, Katie Holmgren is from USA Hockey Director of Program Services. So all the things like Try Hockey Free and all those events really fall under her purview. So I'll let Katie kind of talk a little bit, little bit about them. And, and Gretchen can throw the next slide up and let her go. So Katie, all yours. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. I will, uh, uh, I think Erica's going to have some really good information for you. So we'll go over this fairly quickly. But um, wanted to let you know about the opportunities and the resources that USA Hockey has um, for growth and, and really our program services department is focused on growth at the 8U level, which then translates into uh, growth and retention at older levels. So that's really what a lot of our initiatives are geared towards or most of our initiatives. Um, and then also in the form of support for association leadership to kind of hopefully make your jobs easier. A lot of times when we're talking, it sounds like we're giving you more to do. And uh, we certainly are relying on local association leadership. You guys are really the boots on the ground. We thrive off volunteerism. We can't do what we do without what you do. And really um, everything we have geared towards you is built off best practices for what our local associations do. So um, these are the, the overall national initiatives. <laughs> Sorry, my dog is making some noises here, noisy pugs. <laughs> We, uh, all of our growth initiatives are really there for a resource for you to hopefully, um, some of the things you're already doing, make them easier um, and sort of reward you and, and hopefully help you. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll jump into this, our hat trick growth challenge, which was called the two and two challenge a couple of years ago. We sort of rebranded that, unfortunately, right before the pandemic. Um, so didn't really get a chance to, to go through that with a season. Um, we are revamping it for this season. It used to be you choose items from three buckets and really it was just four pieces in each um, thing. And, you, and depending on what you, what you completed throughout the season, you got rewarded for. So we're trying to make it as we come out of this, we've really gathered a lot of best practices for growth and we're gonna make it a little bit easier to pick and choose what you're doing. Um, a lot of things will be what you're already doing, but the Hat Trick Growth Challenge is there to remind you of all the growth initiatives to do throughout the season. 
Um, we will be launching that soon. I know Jim and, and Gretchen will send that out to the group at large. Um, and so hopefully a lot of you'll be able to participate and then get rewarded for growth initiatives you're already doing. Um, one of those major ones is our Try Hockey for Free dates. Um, this season, those national dates will be November 6th and then March 5th. And if you've participated in them before, the two national dates are where we really provide the most resources, mostly in the form of national marketing. Um, that's why we set national dates for those to help you. Um, those national dates are searchable on our tryhockeyforfree.com website, which we have recently revamped, um, make it a little bit more user-friendly for a new hockey parent. Um, I know Gretchen through our program services website there in the chat. So um, everything I'm talking about, you can find more information on there. You can find ways to contact us on there. Come here. Sorry <laughs> about the pug. Um, you can find ways to contact us there. Myself and Taylor um, are always available to help you and answer more questions about this or run through these more in detail with your associations. Um, our national dates are really our big ones that we push. We send out jerseys for those um, national marketing resources in the form of Halloween cards and Valentine's cards to get into schools. Um, really they're searchable on that map. We also like to let people know that you can use that for any date and we encourage you to use that for any date. And the reason that's important is because if you're registering your Try Hockey for Free Day through that website, you're automatically covered under our Grow the Game sanctioning. So that's a super important piece. Otherwise it has to go through AHI, which isn't a bad thing, but we wanna make sure it's just an easier way for us as program services to work in conjunction with AHI um, and make sure you're covered under USA Hockey Insurance and our Grow the Game. So um, you can use it for any date. The difference there is you don't get um, the jerseys and, and those marketing pieces, although there's lots of marketing materials that are downloadable for you in our new Try Hockey for Free portal. Um, so there's marketing materials, it's just not searchable on that map, but you get a direct link to send out for marketing. So that's the big difference. Um, I see we might have one question. I'm gonna finish going through this and then I'll answer all the questions um, if I can right at the end here so I don't take up too much time. Um, girls Hockey Weekend is a double IHF initiative that really celebrates um, the girls game and encourages you to grow on the girls side. So it's really a celebration of the girls kind of highlights those that might already be involved. And then we give you different ways to kind of invite other girls to the rink and be part of, of a big worldwide celebration of girls hockey. So we don't have dates on that yet. We have not heard from the double IHF. Um, if they don't set a date for this year, just based on pandemic conditions around the world, we will probably do one again. Um, we'll set that earlier than we did last season, but to make sure that we still have that big piece celebrating girls hockey weekend. Um, club excellence is really what I was talking about as far as association support. It's not necessarily growth specific, but it's an online program to help um, an association run through their season successfully. It has uh, lots of tasks kind of listed by month. Um, that aren't required to do, but might help you think of things that you would do each month leading up to the season and through the season. Um, we're incorporating a lot of pieces, girl specific pieces, DEI, as we make that kind of just part of the fabric of what we do at USA Hockey in every position. Um, we have set positions that are already in there that we know most boards already have, um, but hopefully makes it easier. If you have people that are transitioning in and out of roles, that stuff can just live in club excellence for you. Um, you know, if you're the association president or the growth coordinator and you don't necessarily know what another position does, that's what Club Excellence is there to help you with. Um, we put a lot of stuff in there that's standard global roles, but also um, you can customize that to your own association. And then we also have the ability to have, say, AHI upload resources that are specific to um, all of the associations that fall under AHI. Uh, there's new pieces in there, like an analytics tool that kind of gives you real-time membership information based on different zip codes and things. Um, that's been very useful even for us as we're testing it. And we are starting to slowly onboard associations. Club Excellence basically took a two-year hiatus and, and we're right there. So those are our big pieces that lots of people know about in program services. Uh, we have other items coming. Um, we're introducing very shortly a Find Hockey Near You platform that'll be specifically geared towards the younger ages and intro to hockey programs. So the way that will work is your association will essentially apply to be part of it, similar to when you apply to host a Try Hockey for free. Um, we'll vet that information, make sure that the website you put in is really geared towards that beginner level. How does someone get started in your association? And Find Hockey Near You is really, really specifically geared towards new hockey families. 
and making it easier for those people that want to get into hockey, how to find it. So they're not going to necessarily a website that's got lots of AAA and tier one and all that stuff that might be confusing and overwhelming for a new hockey parent, but it will live on our website and then have the ability to embed in other websites so that when people go search it, you know, if they go, if they find a high's website first, they could possibly find it there. So uh, right now, our Find Hockey Near You on USA Hockey's website is really a list of affiliates. If you're not involved in hockey, you probably don't know what an affiliate is. So we want to make that easy for people. Uh, other things we've, we're working on, if you go to our website under the resources portion, uh, resources was really kind of specific to our pandemic. Um, and we made a toolkit for communicating with your membership. We took lots of pieces we were using at the national level, made them easy to replicate at the local level. Um, we've met with Jim. We have a whole affiliate growth coordinator group with um, growth coordinators from all around our other affiliates and really they're sharing ideas and it's been awesome. And we're revamping that toolkit to make sure that we're actually helping associations with what they need. So we've gotten a ton of input. Um, Erica's going to talk about marketing. We're going to do things that are real specific to if you're posting something on Instagram, what size image do you need to use? Um, you know, to make it really plug and play, no brainer. We know not everybody's a marketing genius or a communications genius, and we wanna make it easier for you. So that toolkit right now, if you go to our resources page is very specific to kind of the pandemic and what phases you were in moving forward. We just want it to be a toolkit for growth um, under the program services piece. So we're really excited about that. Uh, Erica is gonna speak on marketing and uh, you will find on that program services resources page, a more detailed, we did a pretty long um, marketing for growth a webinar that will be still very relevant even after the pandemic. And so I just want to plug that and I'll probably put that link in there as well. So I think that covered it very quickly. Um, what all of our resources are, we're going to keep on rolling. Jim, if you think I forgot anything, I feel like no, I'm saying. <laughs> no, I think Sylvain had a question. Go ahead, Sylvain. Still there. Sorry, can you hear me now? You got it, yep. yep. All right, did you guys ever consider changing the date of the skate for free? Um, and the reason is, I don't know about other parts of the country, but in Illinois, hockey starts in September. So by November, like all, like I work for a park district, so all our programming is going on and it's really hard to, in the middle of a learn to skate session to start finding ice to get free stuff, you know, the free, the free skate. And I know that we can use it at other dates, but then your, your marketing tools are awesome, but then we can't use them. So, and great question. And I don't have a great answer for you. Yes, we have considered changing them. The reason we do it then is because we're already into a hockey season. Um, and so a lot of fall sports are already done. And it's really so that we have the ability. I know this is well before, I've been in the department for a couple of years. Um, before that, I was in our adult department for about eight years. Um, there was lots of conversation about changing those dates. Um, one, it's good for marketing with Halloween cards and getting into schools as it becomes increasingly hard to get information into schools. Um, two, it's because other fall sports are done and it gives people the ability to better kind of um, pair with other maybe fall sports to say, okay, now you're done with football or soccer, go try hockey. So um, totally agree with you <laughs> that we know it'd be ideal to have it at the beginning of a hockey season. What we found years ago was that too many people were playing other sports then. So um, okay, I, I like the it's March. Not a great answer, but that's the reasoning behind it. Um, and again, well before I was here. But what we're trying to do, Sylvain, to your point, is make some of those growth resources a little more customizable for the marketing materials, so that they don't all just say November six on them. Um, I know the national marketing that goes through the NHL and stuff is obviously that's our big. We lost thing. you a little bit, Katie. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? There you go. Okay. Uh, I know, you know, our national marketing through the NHL and whatnot is all geared towards that national date, but we're trying to do our best to make sure those other marketing resources um, are a little more customizable. Melissa has a question. I'm off of mute, Melissa. She might be double muted. And if anybody- How about now? Can you hear me? Oh, there you oh, go, Melissa. Sorry. I was gonna say, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat too. I'll, I'll be on and pay attention to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank oh, you. I was, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so I was just gonna say that I understand what Sylvain is saying, but for the Hawks, honestly, having it the week after uh, Halloween and the week after Valentine's Day is what makes it because we give the kids those Valentine's, we give them things to hand out at trick or treat, like little cards. And then we give them the Valentine's Day cards. Like we'll offer to the kids, like to give them enough to take to their class and put in Valentine's bags and stuff. And I feel like if it wasn't that next weekend or that date, we would get a ton less people. So I really like it on that date. And, and just, I think Melissa, to your point, that's a big reason we keep it that date in November. We know that like, for example, in Minnesota, we usually conflict with one of opening hunting weekends, right? And that's always really hard, but it's, um, we've just had more success with those weekends. I will say this year again, to note, the reason we're doing it in March instead of February, so it'll be a little different, is just to capitalize oh. the post Olympic thing. Yeah. Well, it's because it's gonna be right after the Olympics. And so one, we wouldn't get great marketing. <laughs> hearing that we'll possibly have NHL players playing in the Olympics. Um, and then just, we always see a big boost after the Olympics. So we really want to capitalize on that. I do love the March date. Good, great. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope it works for yeah. all of us. <laughs> well, that, hey, and Katie, uh, thanks so much. And Katie's going to yeah. be on. So if you've got any questions for Katie uh, in the interest of time, just go ahead and type them in the chat and she'll, she'll be monitoring that and then helping out answering those questions for us. But, uh, but thank you so much, Katie. Um, great question. So I'm gonna turn it over to Erica Lehman from US Figure Skating, the marketing director there. Uh, I've heard Erica speak several times in her presentation. Uh, she's gonna give us the Reader's Digest version of it today. However, um, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, be, you know, we'll have it available for you to watch. And, and if uh, it's something we wanna reach out to, to Erica to get more on, we can certainly schedule a different time for that. But Erica, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, um, so today we have an abbreviated version of a presentation that I call Get Out of Your Marketing Bubble. Um, so one big thing I've noticed with figure skating clubs, uh, I grew up as a figure skater. I was the president of a club before I started working with figure skating, and now I'm working at figure skating. And the, the marketing end, I mainly focus on grassroots initiatives, so how to get people to decide to learn how to skate or decide to try skating for the first time and sort of move up move up the ladder into competitive figure skating. Um, but one of the biggest things we struggle with is a lot of ranks and clubs are saying, well, we're, we're in touch with all of our skaters and we can kind of like reach out to other people that come skating at the rink or other people we know or people that are like kind of already connected to us, but how do we reach these other communities? How do we get that kid that's like into soccer and or someone that's maybe into art like how do we get these other people to come into our programs and to try skating so this presentation is all about that um, I kind of took bits and pieces that I thought were maybe the most impactful of what I've done before and smooshed them together uh, but if you have any questions feel free to reach out to me my email will be on the last slide it's just elayman at usfigureskating.org and I believe you'll be able to see most of that in the link that Katie um, is going to share in the resources section too. Um, so without further ado, I'll just jump right into it. Um, if I can get my computer to work, here we go. Um, so one of the biggest things to do, I think, before you start anything is to identify who your inner circle is and who your outer circle is. So that inner circle, those are the people that are that are in your classes, that go to your rank, that get your newsletters, that maybe have a friend that skates. They're people that have been to your facility and at least know that you exist and they know what you're offering. So if you're offering grassroots hockey initiatives, if you're offering adult classes, no matter what you're offering, they already sort of know about it. They just maybe haven't pulled the trigger yet. So they're already kind of in your funnel and they're there and you can reach out to them with the right piece of messaging. But your outer circle, those are people that really aren't familiar with your organization at all. They probably never even contemplated skating. There's these people that like skating has never even crossed their mind. And they love the idea of doing what you offer. So maybe they love hockey. They just never have even thought of it. So these are the people that are out there, they're hiking on the weekend, they're playing soccer, they're doing all these things, but they've never actually laced up a pair of skates or even contemplating adding skating to their lives. So we're going to touch on a little bit of what you can do to make sure you're really communicating in the best way possible with that inner circle. And then I'll go into strategies for hitting up that outer circle. Um, so before you want to do anything, so before you do any sort of efforts, paid marketing, free marketing, anything, the biggest thing you can do is to actually audit every stage of your sales funnel and check for what I call leaks. Um, so looking at your sales funnel here, 
at the top, there's awareness and interest. So that's when people are first learning about what you're offering. They're kind of interested in it. They might be poking around or just kind of engaging with you. And then there's a point where they cross over into your website and they're really researching what you have to offer. And they're considering whether they want to be a part of it. They're evaluating if it fits into their life and their schedule. And then they'll ultimately make a purchase. Um, and the biggest thing with that sales funnel is that you are using your social channels, you're using posters, you're using every sort of marketing thing you have to push people into that funnel. So then once they're in there, you really need to make sure you have everything really set in stone so you can push people all the way down that funnel and that there's never a leak. So these people who are really interested on social and they come to your website and they're excited to take part in your program, if they can't find anything or your website gets them lost or they somehow just get this awful registration process and all they're trying to figure out is how much something costs, they're gonna leave and they're gonna go somewhere else. So I consider that a leak in your funnel. So what you really wanna do before you do anything is really look at your sales funnel, evaluate everything from the top to the bottom and make sure that there's no leaks along the way. Um, and a big thing to recognize here is that your inner circle is already in your funnel. So they're there, you just might not know what stage they're in. That outer circle has yet to even come into your funnel. So right now this funnel is just you taking those people who've connected with you and making sure they can get from A to Z. Um, and a good way to do that is to audit what I call your path to conversion. So you just want to think of yourself like a parent that's maybe navigating a website for the first time, trying to register their child for either ice skating lessons or a learn to play program, maybe themselves in an intro to hockey program. Um, and really what they're going to do there is they're probably going to arrive on your website. They're going to do some basic research. They're probably going to look at the schedule, see if the schedule aligns with their programming in their household. And then if the schedule works, they'll probably evaluate the cost. And if it's not astronomical, then they'll take action and register for classes. So no matter what you're offering, whether you're offering figure skating, adult programming, art classes, every single thing will fall into this kind of the same structure right here. So doing research, evaluating, and then registering. So just make sure that when you're auditing your website that someone can take all three of those steps and they don't hit a major roadblock along the way. So if someone's just trying to figure out how much something costs, but they actually have to go fill out your entire like create a profile thing on Max Galaxy just to find out that a skating like a six week set of lessons is $89. That's pretty inefficient. So you just want to make sure that people can always take action when they want and don't hit major roadblocks. Um, another really big thing you can do here just to make sure everyone comes down the funnel appropriately is if you only offer registration at certain times of the year. So let's say you have six week blocks of classes or let's say you only offer registration for hockey at certain times of the year, but you want to make sure that you're capturing information from people that maybe are looking into something, but it's not time to register. Registration doesn't open for another few months, or it's just not the right timing. Always put something on your website where someone can sign up for a registration alert or sign up for more information when registration is available. So then instead of you relying on those people to come back to you when the timing's right, you have permission to contact them and pull them further down your sales funnel when the timing is correct. So always have a, if you can't have registration year round, have a registration alert feature where someone can always sign up to learn more. And then that contact and that communication is in your hand. Um, so with inner circle, the biggest thing you wanna do is just meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. I'll touch on that in a second. And then just get them down that sales funnel by giving them the information they want. Um, so what that looks like with the meet people where you are, not where you want them to be. We always say, you know, like when you think of marketing, I feel like I'm always thinking of like those bulletin boards or your people at your front desk. And you're worrying so much about all these places where your marketing information could be. But really the place where most people are going to do the research and where most people are going to encounter things about your program or encounter the idea of ice skating or just kind of interact with things in general is on their mobile phones. So even if a parent is upstairs in the stands at the arena during a public skate session and they're contemplating, you know what, my kid really loves hockey. I think they should get involved in hockey. I wonder if there's any youth programming here. They're probably not going to get up out of the stands, walk down to the front desk, wait in line at the front desk and talk to the person at the front desk. They're probably just going to pull out their phone and just search right from that seat in the stands. So you always just want to be ready to capture people at that moment when they have that question or where they're going to look something up. So when they have that small computer that's always in their pocket, and they're ready to find an answer, you're right there and can provide it to them. So always remember that people live in a mobile first environment. They're turning to their phones whenever they're trying to look something up um, and they're less likely to pull out their laptop and research something or they're not gonna go down to the front desk. So just whatever you're doing, try to think in a world where someone is using their phone first. Um, so that's a big tip for connecting with your inner circle. Another big thing to remember is that even though we can get really caught up in like social media and your Google searches and all the other types of marketing you're doing and making sure you're doing that really well, 
if your website can't handle all that traffic that you're sending to it, or if that funnel or if your path to conversion is broken and people get to your website and then they kind of drop off because they can't do the actions they want, your marketing's not working for you. So you always want to treat your website like it's the hub of all marketing activities and then have social media, all your other marketing efforts be your spokes and point towards that hub. Um, so just keep that in mind. Whenever you're launching a new campaign, a marketing campaign, never forget your website. Make sure that website can handle everything you're throwing at it and then focus on all those folks. All right, so now that we talked about the inner circle, I have a few tips here on connecting with your outer circle. And this is a tool that we actually utilize at Learn to Skate USA. When we are hosting skate fests across the country, this is kind of similar to like a mini version of Try Hockey for Free. We will go to a rink that's somewhere in the United States, we'll hire some coaches and we will host free skating lessons for people of all ages and abilities just to try it out, get a free lesson, and then we'll connect them with the programs in that area. And we'll do about 10 of these in a given non-pandemic year, um, but we use this exact methodology whenever we are trying to pull people into these. And sometimes we'll be like, you know, in at Wrigley Field on a Tuesday evening when it's like 10 degrees below zero and we'll still have to get people there. So we, since we already flew everyone in and we're still trying to make this happen, we'll have to do that. So I'm gonna walk you guys through the strategy we use to bring these people that have never skated before onto the ice to try skating for the first time. Um, and this is what I call Strangerville. So this is when you're reaching out to strangers. These are people that know nothing about you. They've never been to your website. They know nothing about what you offer. So you have to make sure that in this way you're doing this, you're not using acronyms, you're not using language that they don't understand, and then you're making things very easy to follow and very just front and center, no mixed up language, it's just a really clear call to action. Um, so the first thing you need to do with this is to identify your target audience. I know there's a lot of different thoughts out there, um, but for the most part, and this for figure skating, and I'm guessing this is probably very true with hockey, is that the mother of the household is the chief decision maker for a family. So even though, um, maybe there's more boys than there are girls in hockey at the moment. The mom is generally the one that is making the decisions for the household. She's the one running the family schedule. She's the one carting kids to practice. Um, mom is generally the one making the decisions. And then from looking at our research with Learn to Skate USA, we've noticed that most moms in this group are about age 30 to 45, and they live about 25 miles from a given facility. If they live more than that, they're probably not going to continue with skating because that is a long time commitment to get there and back. So 25 miles is usually that given radius. And then they're pretty busy people and they're connected to their smartphones 24-7, which works out great for us with all of these social media campaigns that we're going to be doing. Um, so now that we kind of know who our target audience is, the big question is how do we get this target audience that we know is out there? We know there's all these like moms who have kids that want to do activities and she wants to drive them there and sign them up for something really meaningful. But how do we get the idea of playing hockey or skating lessons in front of that mom? And the biggest thing we do here is we craft a really enticing offer that's very time sensitive and put it in front of that audience with a paid Facebook and a paid Instagram campaign. We leverage both platforms. Um, and we use this because we feel like it gets in front of someone when they're bored. So when that mom is at the grocery store and she's waiting in line to check out, or when she's, you know, waiting to pick up someone in line at school, or when she's just sitting down and she's cooking dinner and she's looking at her phone, or maybe she's at work and she's taking a coffee break and she's just scrolling through her phone. We want to make sure that we get that information in front of her when she's taking that break and is not absorbed in something else. So she is fully focused on her phone, scrolling through her phone, and we want to get that information in front of her at that time. Um, so looking at what this offer could look like, you want to kind of look at four things. You want to make sure it's very limited time and has, you have a perceived risk of missing out. So if you offer like a free ice skating lesson every Saturday, it doesn't feel that special because someone can take part in that every Saturday. And it feels like something that's just ongoing and there's no sense of like, I have to do this now. Um, you also want to promote this in a very short window. People generally know what they're doing about a week to 10 days out from a weekend or from a certain day. But if you promote something a month in advance, People don't exactly have their schedule set in stone and they don't want to register for something in hopes that something else better might come up. So it's really good to push anything that's free or an introductory offer about seven to 10 days before the event happens. Um, and you want it to feel easily accessible with little to no barriers to entry. So I referenced that giant sign-up form that I've encountered before in Max Galaxy. You want to make sure that if anyone's registering for anything for free, that form feels easy and quick and they can fill it out in two minutes on their phone and they're done. And they're not putting in credit card information, signing a giant waiver, like keep things pretty simple um, and to the point. And then the last thing is you want to sort of tap into those dreams that people might have. So if someone has had, you know, this kind of, oh, I've always wanted to learn how to ice skate. Well, tap into the fact that someone maybe always wanted to learn how to ice skate, or they've wanted to learn how to skate backwards, or 
you can master the basics in a single day or in, think of all the time you'll have with your family. So try to tap into those little dreams that people might have versus just being really straightforward about the ice skating lesson. So here's an example of what I would craft for Learn to Skate USA. And this is exactly what we would do with these campaigns all over the United States. So it was a free introductory ice skating lesson, one day only. We'd have maybe two to three sessions back to back with a limited number of people that would fit in each session. So we had very limited slots and people had to pre-register in order to take part. Uh, completely free, and then we'd only market this 10 days out from the event, which is kind of scary for the people we were partnering with because they're like, we're 10 days away and we don't know how many people are registered. But when it's 10 days away, people already know what they're doing. So it's very easy to get people to sign up and show up. Um, and showing up is really what you want there. And then we really focus on learning how to master the basics in one lesson. So we'll really focus on the fact that like you can learn how to ice skate in just 30 minutes and then you can be off on your own. Uh, so here's an exact example of what we did. We hosted a, a skate fest at Wrigley Field. I didn't have a photo of Wrigley Field when I did this promotion, so I used one from Colorado Springs. Um, but it was on a Tuesday night. The weather ended up being about, I think it was about 10 degrees above freezing. Um, and we filled this entire skate fest and had 120 new families come out to learn how to skate on this freezing cold day. And I believe it was 2019. Um, but this is the exact ad we used. And we filled up all slots in about 48 hours with I believe it was $54 that I put into this paid campaign on Facebook. I slotted 100 and we went through it already. So exact example of um, the text that we used for this campaign. And, and I'm going to show you how you can put some money behind it and make that work. Um, so well, one thing I want to point out here is we use Facebook and Instagram a lot. And I know some people are like, well, but kids aren't on Instagram. The kids are on Snapchat. Or what about YouTube? And while YouTube has a really, really big following across all demographics, YouTube takes a lot of time and energy and has a very different advertising platform than, say, Facebook or Instagram. Um, and then if you look at that target audience, those moms that we're trying to connect with in age 30 to 45, they're really on Facebook and Instagram if we look at this data here. So that's where I always like to settle is into Facebook and Instagram. Um, another great thing is that they're owned by the same company. Facebook owns Instagram, so that data goes back and forth. Um, and when I talk about data, what I mean is not necessarily who I am as a person, but what I really am involved in and what I like to do. So here is an exact screenshot of my Instagram Explore feed from this morning. Um, I tore my ACL a few months ago and I can't really do anything. So all I do is I sit around and I plan how I'm going to redecorate my house. So my entire Instagram Explore feed is nothing but pictures of living rooms that, keep, that Instagram is thinking that I might like. So Right here, you can see that that's a big part of my life right now. It's things I'm clicking on, I'm interacting with, I'm engaging with on Instagram. Well, then lo and behold, when you go to my Facebook, you're going to see ads about things that are related to that. So Havenly is trying to help me redecorate my living room. Ruggable is trying to sell me a new rug to make sure my cat, when he throws up, I can easily just stick it in the washing machine. And then People Magazine is trying to get me to shop on Amazon.com for Prime Day to buy new furniture for my house. So all three of these ads here, well, yes, yeah, sometimes it's annoying to get ads are very suited to my life and what I, the goals I'm trying to accomplish right now and don't feel intrusive to me because they're actually maybe enriching my life and will help me do something that I'm looking to do. So I love Facebook and Instagram advertising. I think it works right here is screenshots of things I got today. So I just really latch on to that if you're gonna move forward with this in the future. Remember that it works. If you do it right, it will hit the right audience and inspire the right person to learn how to skate. Um, so with paid social media marketing, it works really, really well, but the big thing you need to remember when you're doing this is to follow the rules. So with the rules, I say you can just start with a $25 or $50 budget, but you want to make sure you have a good targeting plan in place and you have a timely offer. So once again, that seven to 10 day window for your target audience, and you just have a very rele um, relevant and informative website. So make sure you just check that website and make sure that people can do what they want on there. Um, and then when it comes to targeting, you always want to make sure that your targeting is really working for you. So Earlier, I talked about the fact that we're, you know, our target audience for Learn to Skate USA is moms age 30 to 45. They live within 40, 25 miles of the facility. They are generally, a lot of these people are pretty highly educated. Um, they're interested, probably a lot of parents of figure skaters are very interested in things like Disney on ice, the Olympics, ballet, gymnastics. Um, so if you're doing this for hockey, I would think about like, what would that target audience person be very interested in? But then plug in those same metrics with the age in that driving distance, that 25 miles. Um, so when you're thinking about targeting, really map out like who these people are and what they're interested in before you go any further. And if you don't plug in your targeting, really bad things can happen. So I give an example of like, if I were to have a picnic 
and I gave my mom a hundred dollars to go buy Bean's picnic supplies. She would come back with a gorgeous blanket, a nice picnic basket, maybe some utensils, some nice drinkware and some lemonade, but I'd have no food for the picnic. But if I gave my dad a hundred dollars to go buy picnic supplies, he would probably buy nothing but food and I'd have no other picnic supplies. So I would be out of the blanket, the basket, all those other things. So, but if I gave each of them a very curated list of exactly what I needed for this picnic, both of them would do an excellent job getting what I need. So when you're doing any sort of Facebook advertising or Instagram advertising, you just want to make sure you have that very clear curated shopping list for Facebook and Instagram, and then your ads are going to perform very, very well for you. Um, so to do that, I say to leverage the targeting trilogy. Again, that's just the age, the location, and the interests of someone. So who are you reaching, where are they located, and what they're looking for? Um, and then you can actually also upload a custom audience list to Facebook if you want. If you have a huge customer list that you're trying to tap back into, or you have a list from something else, you can target that. Um, there's some other targeting options, but I think just for starters, it's always good just to use the who, the where, and the what they're interested in. Um, and then here's just how you would go about promoting this. You'd post this, page, this post right there on your Facebook. And then I'm gonna walk you through what it looks like if you were just to boost this on the front end and add some money to this. So I'm gonna put in a $25 campaign with this Facebook post right here. So I'd have the post ready, I'd hit the boost button. Um, up there at the top, I can choose that I want this to, um, to show up on the feed and I don't want it to show up in Messenger and I can choose whether I want a button or not. Um, once I'm there, I can determine who I'm targeting. So I can, this is where I plug in those audience metrics. So I can say that I'm looking for women age 25 to 40 that live within 25 miles of my facility and are interested in certain things. So you can see that I can open this window up and I can plug in exactly who I'm looking to target and I can add in some interests as well. So I can even put in things about demographic data. A lot of parents, moms belong to moms groups on Facebook. So Facebook knows this person's a mom. So Facebook has that data in there as well. Uh, once that's all said and done, I'll just plug in how long I want this, um, this ad to run. So I could say five days. I can say that I want to spend a maximum of $25 for the entire campaign. And then I can say whether I want it on Facebook, Messenger, or Instagram. And I say just start with one. I say start with the Facebook feed for now. Enter your payment option. Preview your ads on each platform, as you can see up here. Hit boost, and then you're done, and your post is out there. And it will run for that exact amount of time you set and for that exact budget you set. Um, so once that's all said and done and your ad runs and you're probably going to get a lot of great traffic, great signups for your offer, whatever you're putting out there, then it's just time to evaluate results. So I always say impressions, reach, engagements, clicks, and KPIs are really good. And I always have to throw a cat into every presentation I do. So there's the cat. Um, and then the last thing is just to remember where all of this falls in your path to conversion. So even though you're doing this great Facebook campaign, you may have 200 people click on it and sign up for this this great initiative that you have, remember that this is before, like if they're clicking on this campaign, engaging with it, they still have to click the link, get to the sign up form, fill out the sign up form and show up on that day of your event. If you're hosting one of those um, sort of learn to skate program, like one day only events, like I was referencing earlier. Um, so here's just a little step-by-step -step action plan I put together. If you're gonna do sort of a try hockey for free day, that's maybe not one of those organized days, or if you wanna promote your try hockey for free event, um, or even if you're wanting to host your own like free lesson day, like come to a free clinic where we're going to teach you the basics of hockey off the ice. And then we're going to go on the ice and we're going to work on some skating skills. You could do that in a one day thing, put together a campaign like that, run it for seven days. And I bet you could probably get about 50 to 100 people to sign up if you chose the right target audience. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell, what we do at Learn to Skate USA. I thought you'd want to see real life examples versus me just kind of giving you hypotheticals of what you could do. I thought it would be great just to show you what we actually do. So um, that's everything there. I believe I went over time a little bit, but thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to figure skater talk about some hockey stuff. <laughs> but if you have any questions, feel free to, I can probably, if you want, I can take some questions now in the chat or feel free to email me too, if you have any. Awesome, thanks Erica. And if anybody has any questions, feel, feel free to ask them now. That's, that's quite all right if you have any. I think one thing besides it being really scary that Facebook knows that much about you, Erica, um, <laughs> and the rest of us, um, I, hopefully you can see some of the advantages of what we can do with, um, uh, you know, with, with you know, the, the social media, the advertising capabilities that Erica kind of walked through. Um, I know, we've, again, I've, I've seen Erica speak a couple of times on this and even the longer presentation, it's, it's intriguing. I think it's a, a great tool that we can utilize in our tool set to, 
to help grow the game, right? And get uh, more folks to the rink, more people of all ages, right? Not just not just AUs, but uh, any age that wants to get involved in, in hockey or skating. So, um, And we've done that exact campaign for an adult only um, camp that we did. We did an, did an adult only skating clinic where we actually filled up all the slots too. So we had room for 50 adults to learn how to skate and we had all 50 come out there, learn how to skate, all everything filled up before the event date. So. Um, this really works well if you if you plan in advance and you trust that short seven to ten ten day window when people know their schedules, it'll work for you. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Great. Right. Well, thank you for having me on. Thank you so much, Erica. I appreciate it. If anybody has any questions for her, you can throw them in chat or she has her email up there as well. Um, so let's kind of you know kind of roll them back a little bit to uh, um, kind of what we've been talking about here locally. Uh, I think you know Erica's. You know, conversation in Katie's as well kind of hits on some of the ideas and some of the things that are out there that people are doing and utilizing that that help us grow the game right both from uh, again at the, the youngest levels all the way up to the adult levels and I think one of the things we we we've heard over the last several months from USA is is you know one of the biggest hits we took was in the adult side right um, because just people weren't coming to the rink they weren't allowed to play especially you know folks at older ages during the pandemic it was uh, it was more difficult and then at the AU level. So those are kind of two of the biggest hits we took. So a couple of things on the screen here too that, to, that kind of parlay off of what Katie and, and Erica were talking about is you know, what has worked, right? And, and obviously what Erica described works. I mean, she's seen the success at, at Learn to Skate USA and USA Figure Skating and, and the amount of people that have been able to draw to the events from utilizing some of that social media and social media advertising. So between Erica and then um, on the screen here, you see from a if you need help on the club social media or rink social media or newsletter assistance or anything like that, you know, first place to start would be with, with Gretchen, our AI communications manager, her emails there as well. And, and if she can help, she can reach out to Erica and Katie and we can, uh, um, we can get you the assistance you need, but she's a good place to start a good resource. She does all of our, our social media marketing as well. Um, the, the other thing, no, stay on that slide, Gretchen. Um, oh, yeah, right there. Um, so a couple of things that have worked, the one goal grant right, that's out there. So there is, we still have equipment left um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the store shed, in the storage shed uh, from the one goal gear that we utilized over the last several years. It's uh, uh, about 150 or so sets. We just gave out a couple more, more sets. So if you have learned skate programs or try hockey for free days or, or program that, that needs uh, access to equipment, uh, that grant program, it's on our website. You can certainly go in and, and grab that uh, that form, fill it out, it'll come to me, and uh, then we can figure out how to get you some gear and, and help uh, help cover that with, with the grants. The two other places that uh, that we can get gear once the one goal gear that we have runs out will be through Pure Hockey. So they offer one goal, the one goal gear now is offered through Pure Hockey, no longer USA specifically. So as we, again, as we get through that inventory, we'll have to transfer and shift over to the Pure Hockey one goal gear uh, that's on their website. You can see that on their site as well. Uh, the cost is roughly the same, um, and so we'll, we're going to be working on some of those grant programs around that because that'll change a little bit uh, based on what we're doing today. And then the quick change goalie gear as well. That's also available on Pure Hockey, and, and a lot of clubs and associations have taken advantage of that. Uh, a lot of rinks as well have taken advantage of the uh, quick change goalie gear so we can get kids through the goalie program, right? That's certainly a, a big a big push as well. Uh, we heard a little bit from, from Katie on track for free, and then there's also try goalie for free days. I know some clubs have run those, some rinks have run those, try goalie for free as well as you're looking to, to create more goaltenders. Because uh, again, like referees, we need goalies to, to play the game. So encouraging those kids at the, at the youngest levels, I think is, um, uh, is uh, Im important for us to, uh, to do. Um, so, you know, uh, a couple of things that have worked, I, I'll kind of tag along. I just, you know, go, I'm gonna go back a few slides in my head, but we'll just leave this one up. But things like a, an 8U Jamboree or 6U Jamboree or uh, the advertising that we just heard about, getting involved in your community around things, different festivals, yard signs, you know, to your, your, you know, I think we talked a little bit about that they don't know who you are, they don't know what's going on at the rink. If you, if you put a, uh, you know, a Winneka yard sign up there somewhere, you put a, uh, you know, a, a, a St. Jude yard sign in, in, in your players, you know, neighborhood, then kids are going to see that, maybe ask about it. Uh, and so it just puts some more visibility into what you're doing. Um, the digital backpacks that uh, I know it's a little harder to get into schools than it used to be. Um, but even things like Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, getting involved in other 
other aspects of that community really will help, I think, uh, all of us get uh, uh, get more kids to the rink, right? Uh, some promotions that we, we've, we've seen that is, that's worked and that's available around, you know, bring a friend to the rink, right? Somebody that's never played, it's never skated, have a bring a friend to the rink kind of day, uh, learn to skate promotions, referral discounts, right? I mean, I don't know if you have them in your clubs or your rinks, if, if, a, if a player in your organization brings a, a new skater to the rink for one of these events, then they get, maybe they get a little, a little discount that person signs up for additional programming. Um, and then looking at, at events during non-school days. So I know a lot of, I talked to a lot of folks around the country in that, on that growth call that, uh, that Katie was referring to, is, you know, 25 or 30 of us kind of get together and just, just chat about what's working. Um, somebody brought up that, that when there's days off from school in, that, in the community, that the rank of the club will utilize that as, a, as an opportunity to have an event where it gives the kids something to do the day that they're off from school. So a, kind of a no school day hockey event. Um, and then flex development programs. Are, you, are, there, are they flexible to you know, dates and times or, or costs if they wanna to commit to certain things? If it's a 10 week program, do they have to do all 10? Can they only do four or five? Are they able to pick and choose uh, you know, the nights that they come? Um, and so offering some flexibility as people's schedules are very busy. And the last one is, getting involved at the high school events, right? So we had a lot of high school hockey folks on the phone today as well that can help in that, in that aspect, but getting, setting up a table at the football game or, or the soccer game, baseball game, the halftime or post game, purchasing ads in their programs that they have them, um, you know, public address announcements at their games. So different ways to, to get your uh, programming, get your rink and get out in front of the community. So, um, so a couple of things there. Go ahead to the next slide, Gretchen. <clears throat> So the, the last thing I'll end on and we'll open up for any conversation is, uh, is the goaltending program. One of the things that has happened here recently is the addition over the last couple of years of, uh, of Steve Thompson at the U at USA Hockey is the goaltending development coordinator for USA Hockey. And he is trying to develop a, 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 a network of goaltending instructors and uh, goaltending development coordinators, as we call them, goal, goalie coaches and chiefs. So kind of the equivalent of what I am from a, the coach and chief side. Uh, and, and here we also have uh, goalie coach in chief uh, as well at Central District and at the, at the AI level and then in developers that can help run these tri goalie for free days and other goalie specific events. Um, and uh, they, you know, they have annual training, they, they work at development camps, they can do club visits. Um, and so they are a resource that you can take advantage of um, to, to do that. They are, uh, if, if they're not, I'll make sure that they're listed on the AI website. Um, I know the USA Hockey has them listed under their goalie, goalie, uh, uh, usagoaltending.com uh, um, and uh, but they are a resource to help us again drive and promote goaltending as you can see the U USA Hockey in general has a goal of 51% of all NHL and women's NCAA minutes are played by US born goalies by the year 2030 so so that's kind of the goal as well um, as well there so um, and, you know one thing that I didn't mention and in, in being involved in the girls hockey myself is um, is you know girls specific events right so if you have uh, if you're looking to, to, to develop girls programming or, or get more girls involved, they are the, one of the fastest growing segments of USA hockey. Um, so we all should be uh, doing that just uh, for a lot of reasons, but just because we should be um, and getting them to rank. So I know Anita's on, on the line here as well. She runs our, our girls committee and uh, is a great resource as well for, for girls specific programming. Certainly Katie and Erica can, can, uh, can assist as well, but Anita's kind of the point of contact for that. So I would encourage that. Um, I think uh, it's a great opportunity, again, a real fast growing, the fastest growing segment, quite frankly, in the last several years, if, I, if I'm correct, uh, within USA Hockey. So take advantage of that. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll end. Are there any questions or comments or thoughts or anybody wants to add anything uh, before we, we cut you loose a few minutes early here and uh, get your night back? No? Okay. All right, so this, um, this information will be posted up here in, in a couple of days um, as well. If you have any questions, certainly reach out to myself or anybody you heard from today on the, on the call. I really, really appreciate, you know, we had 37, 38 people on the, on the line tonight. I appreciate you taking your time uh, to listen in to what's going on on the growth side of the business. And it's certainly key to what we do. We want to continue to, to have these kids at the rank. We've got to figure out a way to make sure we get them there and, and give them a great experience when they, when they show up and, and that's uh, that's our goal, my goal, and I think everybody's goal. So, 
Um, so with that, I'll, I'll call it a night. And I, again, appreciate all your time. Thanks, Katie and Erica, for, uh, for joining us. And look forward to seeing everybody on the next, uh, the next uh, Zoom. Link.